Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamualaikum, Jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iTunes number one kids and family podcast. And a nominee for the best kids and family podcast at the iHeart Radio Podcast Awards. We are so very happy that you're joining us today. So very grateful that you're part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids podcast family. We have a wonderful guest for you today coming to us from southwestern Ontario in Canada. His name is Kevin Sands. You know, before Kevin gets in here, I know it is such a very, very busy time of the year. That's one reason we're so grateful that you're taking the time to join us today. Maybe, maybe you're listening to us in the car as you're rushing from one part of the world to another with another task to do, something else to think about, somebody else to buy a gift for. Well, if you're looking for gift suggestions for any kind of curious kid on your shopping list, we have an easy solution. Little Passports. Little Passports is a perfect holiday gift for curious kids of all ages. Little Passports delivers fun-filled packages right to their door every single month with engaging hands-on activities, interactive projects, and unique souvenirs just waiting to be discovered. Little Passports monthly subscriptions are designed to spark children's curiosity about geography, world cultures, or science. From exploring sea creatures in Costa Rica to building a Big Ben just like the one in England or making an ancient Greek headpiece, every month is a different adventure that will fuel their imaginations and spark their natural curiosity of the world around them. It is the perfect gift for kids ages 3 to 13 this holiday season. Order today for holiday delivery at littlepassports.com slash reading. That's littlepassports.com slash reading. Before we bring Kevin in, we want to give a big shout out to Donna Sager Cowan. She is the author of With the Courage of a Mouse. And With the Courage of a Mouth is our latest Reading with Your Kids certified great read. With the Courage of a Mouse is a debut book in the Superhero School series written by Donna Sager Cowan and illustrated by Diane J. Reed. This fast-paced debut chapter book set in Sweet Meadows follows the adventures of a remarkably resourceful and intelligent mouse named Simon Cheddar and a kind and innocent cat named Cat. Simon and Cat connect immediately as they seem to have lots in common, including their interest in attending a superhero school at the community center. With the Courage of a Mouse really is a fantastic book and a great addition to your family library. Read all about the book on our blog at readingwithyourkids.com. Once again, great big congratulations to Donna Sega Cowan. Her book, With the Courage of a Mouse, is our latest Reading With Your Kids certified great read. Joining us on the line right now from Ontario in Canada. And we just had a great conversation about the beautiful country of Canada. So I'm really excited. He's the author of The Blackthorn Key Adventures, a super middle grade series. Please welcome to the show, Kevin Sands. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We were, as, as I mentioned, we were just speaking about your, your beautiful country and how diverse it is and how vast it is and how wonderful it is. And uh, right now, I want to talk about this, this beautiful universe that you've created in the Blackthorn Key Adventures. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay, so there's uh, four books in the series so far. The first book is called The Blackthorn Key, and it tells the story of Christopher, who's an apothecary's apprentice. And he and his best friend, Tom, get mixed up in trying to stop this mysterious cult that's been murdering people on the streets of London in 1665. Uh, it's an adventure, and it, you'll find mystery, friendship, intrigue, danger, codes, puzzles, potions, and pigeons. And uh, <laughs> def- definitely pigeons. And if you like explosions, there's a few of them in there. So that was the first book in the series. It came out in uh, 2015, and I've had one book out every year since then, uh, up to the four books. So the second book, Mark of the Plague, uh, takes place during the Great Plague of London, a uh, terrible time there. They have to solve a new mystery. Third book is The Assassin's Curse, in which uh, Christopher Tom and their friend Sally get sent to Paris 
on a mission for the king, and they have to stop an assassin, and there's a treasure hunt. And then the brand new book, Call of the Wraith, just came out two uh, about two months ago, and uh, in this one, Christopher gets shipwrecked. Uh, in the southern coast of England, uh, where he discovers children have been disappearing. And they believe it's a ghost that's been stealing the children away. So that's what exists so far in the Blackthorn Key Adventures. Wow. Talk about excitement. It, it, you're, you're covering just about everything. I mean, for a middle grade series, just learning the word apothecary makes, <laughs> makes it a worthwhile investment. But... You know, as I'm listening to it, and, and I'm thinking, yeah, I can definitely see how the middle grade kid boys, but also girls, would get into this. Do you ever, when when, when you're talking um, about your books that that have murder and explosions and disappearing children, uh, do parents ever kind of, um, uh, you know, express any concerns about I don't want my my ten year olds reading about this kind of stuff? Uh, very, very rarely. Uh, what I always advise, of course, is that if, you know, if parents think that it's, it's, uh, going to be a bit much for their children, of course, it's always great when the parents get to chance to read the books themselves. Um, and they can sort of direct it. I've had a few parents who said, you know, uh, my child's a bit of a sensitive soul, and so I'll, I'll wait a couple of years before, before he or she will read that. But a lot of the time, uh, you know, the kids, the kids really like that sort of stuff. And I do my best to never be gratuitous about that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the kids do like sort of the grim and the dark that happens uh, when it's balanced anyway, as I do with some lightness uh, and some kindness and friendship and humor. Um, so, so far, I haven't, uh, I, I've had very, very positive reactions. And, and I agree. I mean, I, I, th- I personally don't think, um, that the subjects are too, you know, are inappropriate for, for that age group, especially when it's um, communicated in a way that's sensitive and respectful of the kid's age, and it's not gratuitous. And I do agree that kids really are intrigued with this, and it really captivates their attention. And um, and again, I, I, I lo- you, we're all about encouraging parents to read with their kids, not just with their babies on their laps, but through middle grade, through uh, the young adult years, through, uh, you know, it's great to have a book club with your adult child and talk about books. Yep. So I definitely think that this would be a great series for folks to, to for parents and, and kids to read together. Thank you. And I actually, I, I when I write the books, I actually write them with sort of an, an ear towards what does it sound like when it's going to be read out loud. Because I'm actually hoping, I love it to hear when, you know, sometimes parents will, will write to me and they'll say, oh, you know, we read the books together. And that's sort of my favorite thing when both parents and their children can enjoy the books together, can enjoy that time, can enjoy the stories. Mm-hmm. And so I always write I read my books aloud to myself at least two or three times toward the end to make sure the cadence is right and to make sure, uh, uh, you know, that everything sounds right. So you're going to you're going to do the read aloud. So, yeah, that's that's I love to hear that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And and one of the things that I communicated with my kids as they were growing up and um, I I do a lot of reading at the gym, so I can't read aloud at the gym. But (laughs) it's, you know, reading aloud, it just gives it just gives the story an, an extra dimension. I, I think a lot of people, I, I try to read a lot in my head and, you know, which kind of explains what kind of craziness is going on in my head. But well, I do it too. I do it too. <laughs> but it does. It just, it just, it, it, it does a couple of things. First, it helps you visualize what's going on so much more. And, and when you're reading it with the emotion that it belongs with the story and with, with, with what's going on, the action, um, it, it, it makes it more real and, and it gives you a completely different perspective on, on the story. 100%. I think it really brings it to life. It brings, especially in, in many ways, it brings the characters to life even more than they, than they do when you read it on the page because you get a sense of how they're speaking to each other. Maybe, I don't know if, you know, some parents might do voices, some might not be able to do different voices, but even if you you don't, it's just as you read it, you can kind of imagine these people speaking to each other. And so it really does bring it alive just in a way that, that just like reading on the page doesn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, why did you choose this point in history to um, create the, the Blackthorn Key Adventures? 
Well, actually, I, when I first had the concept, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to make it at a specific point in history or if I wanted to make it a fantasy or maybe kind of a blend of the two or an alt history or something like that. So it really came down to doing the research. And I pretty quickly narrowed it down to Restoration London, which would be 1660s London. Uh, because of what was going on at the time. So they just, they'd killed the previous king, and then they had the Commonwealth uh, with Oliver Cromwell, and then when that collapsed, they brought the king back in 1660. And so you had this kind of, th there was still this struggle for power that was going on, and there were all these plots and conspiracies, and I just thought that would be a really rich environment in which I could tell stories that were really all about puzzles and secret codes and plots and conspiracies and that kind of thing. And then blend it in with we have some wonderful uh, primary resources of the time, like things like Samuel Pepys's diary, which really tells us what life was like at the time, what people wore, what they ate, what they what they did. And so I knew that I had all this research which I could help bring the story to life and make it feel like the reader is really there. And so for me, ultimately, with all of that together, it was just too good a time to pass up. Yeah. And it also seems that that kids were more kind of integrated into the whole society. I mean, right now, you know, childhood is, boom, you're, you're there and you're a child and these are the things that you guys do. And, you know, whereas... There was a, it seems to be a lot more interaction and kids, you know, you know, life, life was shorter then. So it seems like kids kind of grew up faster back then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, that, that gives, uh, as an author, that gives you a lot of freedom with what your characters can do. I mean, if you, there's a point, and I don't want to spoil anything in the book, but there's a point in which Christopher kind of has to leave his home. And he's kind of put out on the street almost. And it's sort of like, now you've got to fend for yourself. And, of course, that would never happen in our modern-day society. There would always be someone to look out for you. But if you didn't have someone to look out for you, you've kind of got to fend for yourself. And so I, I do like stories a lot where the children are the heroes, mm -hmm. that they kind of can't rely on anyone but themselves and their friends and their own wits. And so in many ways, it was sort of a, a, a much a harder and a much harsher time. Um, mm -hmm. But that gives... Uh, well, it causes problems for our hero, which is always good for a story. Uh, it's much more drama. It also gives them the opportunity to really shine with their own skills and their abilities and uh, uh, to bring friendship into the mix uh, in a way that we wouldn't, you know, they just can't rely on, on uh, adults. Absolutely. And that's, that's a, a deeper friendship than I think um, a, a lot of kids experience uh, these days. Yeah, I, I think so, too, uh, in large, in, at least in some part, because, you know, we don't have the, the barrier between us of things like phones and texting. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, you think, well, now you, you can keep in touch much more easily. But there's something impersonal mm -hmm. about that, you know, as opposed to, well, it's just you and me and we're here in person and we're going to have a conversation. We're going to be able to go out on, on adventures. And so friendship was actually one of the most important things I wanted to write about. Uh, and in the book, Christopher and Tom, they absolutely are the best of friends. They're utterly, utterly loyal to each other. Um, and they really would do anything for each other. And that was something that was very important to me when I wrote the book. I knew whatever the book was going, wherever it was going to go, that friendship, um, and, and love was sort of going to be at the, at the heart of that. Uh, and that's, that's how I kind of structured and wrote the book. <sighs> That's that's fantastic. I love that. What specific message about friendship or lesson about friendship do you hope kids take away from the experience they have reading the Blackthorn, Blackthorn Key Adventures? Kevin will be back in just a minute to tell us a little bit more about that message of friendship that he wants to deliver in the Blackthorn Key Adventures. Right now, I have a message that I want you to, to hear. I want to deliver to you because I've I had such a great time. I think this is such a, a wonderful product, a wonderful gift, a wonderful way to spark kids' curiosity and, and also a great way to, to build friendships, kids coming together, working together with a little Passport subscription. What a great way to build friendships that are based on curiosity and supporting that curiosity with a friend. And, and what about the great relationships and the great times 
parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts can have working together with the little passport subscription that you have given to that curious kid on your list. Little Passports is the perfect holiday gift for curious kids of all ages. Little Passports delivers fun-filled packages right to their door every month with engaging, hands-on activities, interactive projects, and unique souvenirs just waiting to be discovered. Little Passports monthly subscriptions are designed to spark children's curiosity about geography, world cultures, or science. From exploring sea creatures in Costa Rica to building a big bin like the one in England or making an ancient Greek headpiece, Every month is a different adventure that will fuel their imagination and spark their natural curiosity of the world around them. It's the perfect gift for kids ages 3 to 13 this holiday season. Order today for holiday delivery at littlepassports.com slash reading. littlepassports.com slash reading. Take away from the experience they have reading the Blackthorn, Blackthorn Key Adventures. Mostly, it's all about supporting each other, you know, and not being shy about supporting each other. You know, you've got these these two friends, these two boys, and then in the second, third, and the fourth book, Sally uh, comes into the mix, um, and they're basically they'll just like they'll just sort of go to the end without giving any spoilers. They'll go to the ends of the earth for each other. Um, and that is something, you know, when, when we look back as adults, we see some, some of the friendships I had as a child were some of the most meaningful and some of the most important. Um, and so there is kind of a sense of, you know, really treasure your friends and, and look to your friends for help. And on the set, by the same token, you be there for your friends when they need your help and you look after each other and you'll just have some of the most rewarding, uh, rewarding relationships you'll ever have in your life. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that, that, that I ask authors all the time of what kind of conversations can families have when they're reading your, your book, and I think you've brought up a really great conversation point for parents and kids, that whole conversation about friendship. Um, I, and, and Because I don't, you know, I, I think we, we talk a lot. I remember being a kid and thinking, you know, I was one of those people who just spoke to everybody and I thought everybody was my friend. And, right. but, but I had a teacher in, in, in high school who kind of woke us all up and said, you know, when, when you get to be middle aged or 40, 50 years old, if you look back and you have one friend, one real friend, you're really lucky and you're doing better than most people. And I thought that that was crazy. But that was that was very wise. <laughs> it's, it really is. It really is. Yeah. No. It's it's. There's something special about the bonds of friendship when you're young. Uh, there's something that's carefree about it, uh, and something that just it doesn't. And every every parent who is listening to this will, I think, have the same experience as you were describing, and, and I have seen myself that that other things sort of get in the way, and sometimes people have to move for their jobs and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And so that bond of friendship is really something that I think it's it's if you have the wisdom of of the ages, you know, that's something that should really be treasured. And it was very that's part of why it's very important to me to have that. Uh, to have that in the book, because I know there's a, there's been a trend over the past several years to have stories where it's kind of like even if you have a band of heroes, they're they're kind of at each other's throats all the time, and mm-hmm. they they fight a lot, and they're kind of coming from very different places, and they only band together almost because they need to, and that can make for an interesting story without question. But you know, I I've always kind of preferred it when you've just got people who are 100% they care for each other and spend time with each other and will do anything for each other. And so that's really why I, why I aimed to write the book in that way. Do you think, now this is just silly, but just popped into my mind. Do you think that um, being um, Canadian kind of influenced that? You know, we always talk about the similarities between the United States and Canada, but there's also a real difference in, you know, Canada has this great reputation for being so polite and friendly and open-minded and everything. Uh, whereas I guess we're kind of, you know, you know, individualistic or, or whatever, but I, I'm, and, and this, it, it might be a silly question, but it just popped in my, into my mind. 
I'm, I'm not sure because, you know, I've had occasion to travel through most of the parts of the United States. I mean, regionally, obviously, I've, I've, it's a giant country and I haven't been to, to most towns, but just through, through certain sections. And I'd never really traveled much to the United States before I, I sold the books and, and began to tour and stuff like that. But I, I mean, I noticed, you know, my very first part was through the South. And everyone is so uh, friendly in the South and so mm -hmm. uh, so polite. You know, I lived in Toronto for the longest time. And so there's something impersonal about living in a big city. And I, I remember I was just walking down the street and people, strangers, I'd never seen them before and I would never see them again. But they would smile and say hello. And it just seemed like even in, I think the first place I went was somewhere like Nashville. So even, which is not a giant city, but nonetheless, there was this real flavor of just uh, 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 friendship and kindness and hospitality there. And it's actually something that I've sort of noticed going place to place to place. And I wonder if what you're talking about, sometimes I think we look at the media and we look at the television shows mm -hmm. and, and movies and so on and so forth, where it sort of exacerbates conflict between mm -hmm. people. But when you go to the individual communities, and I've found this whether it's in Canada or whether in, in the United States, you go to the individual communities and you really see that sense of, of community and hospitality. So I, I really think it, it lives it lives everywhere. That's been my experience. Yeah. Well it's certainly been my experience too. Um my my the first time I took my daughter down south, we were down in Nashville. And she she was amazed by the same thing. You know, she went to um, attended high school in downtown Boston, and she would often say that you know, middle aged men would bump into her walking down the street and not even look her way. <laughs> and you know, forget about saying excuse me. They wouldn't even stop. And meanwhile, down she got down south, and people are opening up the door for her and saying hello and how are you and smiling, and actually looking her in the eyes. It's so friendly, it actually throws you off you, because you get in this bubble of the city where nobody looks at each other and nobody talks at each other. You're right, you're like bumping up against each other, but then you go somewhere, someone says hello to you, and you're like, the first thing is, wait, what, what just happened? <laughs> and, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's wonderful. And you'll find those pockets, I do think you'll find those pockets everywhere. Probably everywhere you go outside of a, of a very large city, which again can be impersonal. But yeah, you see it everywhere, and, and that's nice to see. And it is, it is nice to see. And, um, I, I, and, and I loved talking about, that was one of the things that, that my daughter and I really enjoyed talking about was the differences in cities and how people interacted and just being aware of that. And I think, you know, we talk about how invaluable it is for, for families to talk about stories they read. I think it's just as important to talk about the kind of stories that we experience, talk about those stories that we experience in, in our daily lives. And I think, uh, as, as we're reading to kids, reading those picture books to kids when they're four and five or two and three years old, that's good practice, uh, to, to kind of get into that habit of talking about the stories that are happening to our, to us in daily life. Absolutely. I, I think there's, there's really very, very little you can do with your own child better that's that's a better bonding activity than certainly when they're very very young to read those uh read stories together whether they're sitting on the lap your lap or they're sitting beside you or they're just kind of dozing off that's a real level of bonding i think um that's I, i'm just not really sure there's much else that can really replicate that mm -hmm. and that's part of why i love to hear when people, when the kids get older, you know, their middle grade, early teens, or even into their teens, that you hear people will read together and will experience those stories together because that's kind of, you know, you experience something that you don't, you don't even get in your own daily life. So you can share your own stories of the things that have happened to you, but then you experience stories about other worlds and other adventures and so on and so forth. And I just think it's it's one of the best things that families can do together. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I just for some reason the you know um, uh, an image or images flashed in my mind of of storytelling, and you know when kids get into musical theater and you know theater and, and that kind of stuff, they grow this bond that's so tight. You know, theater kids just just have this friendship, and I think it's a lot around the fact that they're 
involved in, in telling each other these stories together and then telling the audience these stories. I, I agree with you. I actually did uh, drama when I was uh, when I was a kid. I, I did for, for many, many years, almost about 10 years, I think. Um, we had this drama program where I was going up every Saturday and every year we'd all come together, all the kids, and we would do this play. And it was a real, like it was a real serious production that, that we would put on. And those are still some of the fondest times I can remember mm -hmm. of my childhood because I absolutely loved doing that. I absolutely loved being part of the stories. I wished that I would go on and continue doing that later in life. Uh, and I never continued with the acting because sadly I'm a terrible actor and I knew it, but I loved doing it, right? That was what was most important. I loved doing it. So I knew I couldn't do it professionally. Um, but uh, that's why it's a surprise to me because I didn't, I, I didn't really have any, any interest in writing mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but it came to me later in life, a friend of mine encouraged me because she knew how much I love stories. Why don't you try writing stories of your own? She said, so uh, okay, well, okay, because I'd always loved them. And once I did that, that's when I found that I, I, that this was really what I wanted to do. So the actual writing part came very, very late in life. But I think a lot of it had actually come from things like from, from the books that I had read when I was a kid and a lot of it with the drama where I could actually live out those stories. Excellent. Well, we know the four, uh, the first four chapters in the Blackthorn Key Adventures are available right now. Are there going to be future editions? Uh, yes, I, I certainly plan to have many more. I don't have a fixed number in mind. It's not like there has to be this many and that, this, like Harry Potter, it was going to be one year for every school year, and that was it. It was seven books. Mm -hmm. In this case, it could kind of go on forever. So it's basically however long, you know, as long as I can keep thinking of good good ideas and people want to keep reading them, uh, there will be more. At the moment, I am starting to work on something entirely new. Uh, it's a new series. It's a fantasy series. So I do want to put at least one or, or two books of that out before mm -hmm. I return to Blackthorn Key number five. But uh, I hope there'll be a Blackthorn Key number five, six, seven, and, and beyond. Excellent. Well, I know folks are going to want to connect with you and find out more about, about the Black Phone Key Adventures and about this new series that you're putting together. Tell folks where they connect, can, can connect with you on the Internet. The best place to connect with me is on my website, which is kevinsandsbooks.com. Uh, and in fact, I do have, you can learn all about my books there and anything upcoming. And uh, you can contact me. And I also have a newsletter so they can sign up there uh, on the newsletter, and they'll get a sneak peek of the latest book, Call of the Wraith, um, and they can send me uh, emails. I always love to hear from fans. Uh, I'm also pretty active on Twitter, same handle, Kevin Sands Books. Uh, they can reach me there. But uh, absolutely check out my website, check out my newsletter, and please uh, uh, send, me, send me a letter. I'd love to get them. Awesome. Well, the name of the series is The Blackthorn Key Adventures. Our guest today has been Kevin Sands. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Elizabeth Dufek. Elizabeth Dufek, she is the author of The Traveling Dress, and she will be here on the next edition of the show. Hey, if you are the author with a great children's book and would love to be a guest on our show, well, we would love to have you on. Being a guest on the show gives you an opportunity to tell thousands and thousands of people about your fantastic children's book. And check it out. Being a guest, it's fun, it's easy, and it is absolutely free. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let us know all about your great book. We'll let you know about the next easy steps. Speaking of easy, hey, if you haven't already done it, we would be so very grateful if you would take a minute to vote for us on the iHeartRadio Podcast Awards website. We are nominated for the best kids and family podcast this year at iHeartRadio, and we would love to have your support. Voting is really easy, and it is free. Check it all out at the iHeartRadio Podcast Awards website. Hey, we also want to thank our friends at littlepassports.com slash reading. Little Passports is the perfect holiday gift for that curious kid on your list. With a subscription to Little Passports, kids get a fun-filled package each month designed to inspire their curiosity in geography, rural cultures, or science. For kids of all ages, order today for holiday delivery at littlepassports.com slash reading. 
Hey, we want to thank Kevin Sands, and we also want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.